In this video, we're going to discuss absolute max and absolute min. This is also called absolute extremes. We're going to be looking for the absolute maximum height of the function on a closed interval a, b. Of course, closed means that a and b are included, so we're using the square brackets here for the interval. An absolute maximum of the function occurs at an x value, where occurs at an x value called x naught, where the height of the function at x naught is greater than or equal to the height of the function at all other x values in the interval. This is called an absolute max. Of course, we could also define an absolute min, and the absolute min would occur at an x value where the height of the function at the x value would be less than or equal to all other heights of the function in that interval. That would be called an absolute min. As you can see, the absolute min is totally analogous to the absolute max. We're going to focus on the max in the next slides. There's a little bit to point out for the terminology here. When we find an absolute maximum, we figure out where the x value is occurring. If you're looking for the x value, then you're asking where does the absolute max occur at? What is the x value? On the other hand, you could ask what is the value of the maximum? That's talking about the y value. Let's take a look at some pictures. Here are a bunch of functions um, on an interval from a to b. As you can see, the a and the b are included for this first picture. And as as we look at this function, we can see that the absolute highest value of the function occurs here. What we want to notice about this point is that it's at a maximum on the graph and the first derivative would be zero because the tangent line at that point would have slope zero. Let's look at the next function here. The absolute highest value of the function in this case appears here at x equals b. In this case, it's occurring at one of the endpoints of the interval. And finally, here's one more example where we have the absolute maximum height of the function occurring at a kink in the graph. And of course, as you know, for a kink, the first derivative does not exist. Let's just take a look at this final picture. Here, because the endpoints are not included, there is no absolute max because the height of the function keeps going up and up and up and up and up, but it never actually hits the value up here because this is an open circle, okay? Because f of x is not actually defined on the full interval from a to b with a and b included, we have no absolute maximum in that picture, okay? So there's a handy little theorem here where as long as the function is continuous on the closed interval. In other words, as long as it's defined on the whole interval and there's no jumps or discontinuities from A to B, then you are guaranteed that an absolute max and an absolute min will occur on the interval. As you can see, this picture over here does not follow that pattern. The function is not defined on the endpoints. So because it's not defined on the whole interval, we are not guaranteed that an, that an absolute max or an absolute min will exist. Okay, these other pictures, uh, the function is defined on the whole interval, including the endpoints, so the absolute max and the absolute mins as well, they all do exist for these other pictures. Okay, let's focus in on these pictures where they do exist, and what you'll notice is that the absolute maximum occurs. There's only three cases here. Either the first derivative is zero, or the first derivative doesn't exist, or the max occurs at one of the endpoints. And you can check this out for the min values too. The minimum of the graph could occur where the first derivative is zero, or it could occur at a kink in the graph, or it could occur at one of the endpoints. These values where the first derivative either doesn't exist or is equal to zero, these are called critical points, okay? This is critical in order to find the absolute max and min is that we're going to have to find the critical points. Uh, critical points are points like this and this and this and this where the first derivative is either equal to zero or doesn't exist. Absolute max and min occur either at a critical point on the interior of the interval or at the end point. This makes our steps in order to find absolute extremes pretty straightforward. Step one is to find all critical points in the interior of the interval by examining the derivative and determining which x values make the derivative zero and which x values make the derivative not exist. Once you know where the critical points are on the interior of the interval, then you can just compare what is the height of the 
the function at the critical points and what is the height of the function at the end points. The biggest value is the maximum and the smallest value is the minimum. Okay, so those are the steps we're gonna be following. Make sure that you know these steps. These steps will not be provided to you on the exam. Similar to the previous couple of videos that we have done where a bunch of steps are lined out for you, say for linearization or implicit differentiation or logarithmic differentiation. You gotta know what these steps are from this point forward in the class, okay? So now you know, put it on a flashcard, put it on a study sheet, make sure you know these steps for finding an absolute extreme of a continuous function on a closed interval. First, find the critical points and then compare the height of the function at the critical points and at the end points. Okay, let's check out an example. We're gonna be doing this function, x times e to the minus x squared over eight, and the interval in question here is from minus one to four. Notice that it says absolute extremes. What extremes means is maximum and min. So we're actually asked to find both here because it's not specified. We should be finding both the absolute max and the absolute min on the interval from minus one to four. Okay, first step, like we said in the last slide, is we have to find the critical points on the interior of the interval from minus one to four, not including the endpoints. We'll take care of that in the next step. But let's calculate the first derivative. Of course, we have to do the product rule together with the chain rule. Make sure that you check this out and maybe pause the video and do the product rule on your own. As you can see at this point, it's a little messy. And in these problems, we absolutely must, 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 must simplify. Here we go. I'm pulling out the exponential in order to simplify. And I'm also collecting a common denominator to simplify even further. It is so, so important in these problems where we're trying to figure out where does the first derivative equal zero and where does the first derivative not exist that we simplify the first derivative as much as possible. And in every problem, you should be getting a common denominator and get it as a quotient where you have one quantity divided by another quantity for the first derivative. Now, as you know, if a quantity is equal to zero, that means the numerator is equal to zero. So the first derivative is equal to zero if the numerator is equal to zero. The first derivative will not exist if there's an x value making the denominator equal to zero. So let's check it out in our case. In our case, if you look at our numerator here, this numerator is going to be equal to zero if x is equal to plus two or if x is equal to minus two. This denominator is just four, okay? So there's no x value that makes the derivative not exist in this particular case. What you also want to notice is that the exponential over here, even though it looks a little messy and confusing, this is actually something we don't even have to worry about. If you remember of just the basics for exponentials, e raised to any power, the height of the e to the u function looks something like this. The height of that function, it always exists. It's never equal to zero. Okay, so exponentials, even though they might look like they're complicating the, the situation here, we don't even have to worry about this. Exponentials are never zero. In fact, they're always positive and they always exist. So there's no problems for the exponential and it does not contribute to the first derivative equaling zero or not existing. Okay, so we've got two critical points. In this case, x is equal to positive two and x is equal to negative two. Notice that x equals negative two is not in our interval. We're only looking at the interval from minus one to four. Negative two is not included in that interval. Okay, so one of these critical points is getting thrown away in this particular case. Now, in other problems, other things might occur. Maybe you get five critical points and you're throwing two of them away. Maybe you get three critical points and they're all in the interval and you don't throw anything away, right? You have to analyze your problem based on your interval, figure out your critical points and throw away if it's not in your interval. That just because the video example had one critical point in the interior of the interval that every example is going to turn out that way. You could get a lot of different answers here. For us, there's only one relevant critical point at x equals two in this problem. Okay, and the final step as we discussed in the first slides here, we're going to compare what is the height of the function at the critical point f of two and what is the height of the function at the end points at negative one and four. Now we're going back to the original function and <clears throat> we're going to record our answer at the bottom here. There we go. We can just plug things into the original function. We can estimate with the calculator here so we can actually see what's biggest and what's smallest and then we can fill in the blanks here. Looks like the biggest value that we're getting is 1.21. That is occurring at x equals 2 and the smallest value that we're getting
getting is the negative 0.88, and that is occurring at x equals negative 1. So there you go. That's it for this video. Make sure that you know the steps for finding the absolute max and the absolute min on a closed interval. Most importantly, bring your questions into class. I will see you then.